Okay, here's the next 10 questions then, folks. So, uh, question 21, what's the effect of increasing temperature on the rate constant K? Well, if you increase temperature, you make the rate faster, so because you make the rate constant bigger. So it does change the rate constant. It doesn't decrease. Uh, it increases exponentially, okay? Because remember, if you increase the temperature reaction by, uh, what is it? 10 degrees C, you double the rate of reaction, okay? So it's not like 10 degrees C and then it's 10 times faster. So it's 10 degrees C, you double the rate. So that's an exponential increase rather than proportional. So I'm gonna go with increases exponentially. Uh, not this one, it doesn't increase proportionally, it's exponentially. Of course, if we link it back to the uh, Arrhenius equation, K equals A exponential of minus EA over RT. So it is your exponential function in there. So it increases exponentially. Twenty-two. What is the effect of increasing the temperature in this reaction? Okay, so delta H is less than zero, so it's exothermic in the forward sense. So if we increase the temperature, it's going to shift to the left because the reverse reaction will be endothermic, going backwards. So if it shifts to the left, then the concentration of hydrogen ions is going to decrease. And if the concentration of hydrogen ions decreases, then the pH, of course, increases. Because a high concentration of hydrogen ions will give us a low pH. So the pH will increase, it'll become less acidic. Uh, ruling that one out, CO2 pressure will decrease. Well, no, it's going to form more CO2, so the pressure would increase. And the equilibrium still shifts to the right. No, it shifts to the left. So B is the right answer. 23, one mole of nitrogen, one mole of hydrogen, and one mole of ammonia are placed in a one decimeter cubed sealed flask. They're doing that, so it makes it nice and easy because the mole values are basically still the concentrations then because they're just divided by one to keep concentrations. And left reach equilibrium, the equilibrium, the concentration of nitrogen is 0.8. Okay, so let's create an ice table. So we've got nitrogen plus three hydrogens, <coughs> giving us our two ammonias. And then we've got our initial, a change, and equilibrium. So the initial number of moles, you've got one mole of ammonia, sorry, nitrogen, one mole of hydrogen, and one mole of ammonia. So they do actually have product in, which is unusual, because it's normally just to put the reactants together. So, okay, so at equilibrium, we've got 0.8 moles of nitrogen. So that has gone down by 0.2. That's a change of 0.2. So how would the rest of these guys change? Well, three hydrogens react with one nitrogen. So if 0.2 moles of nitrogen have reacted, then 0.6 moles, three times that amount of hydrogen have reacted. So it's gone from one down 0.6, so there'll be 0.4 equilibrium. And then it's a two to one ratio. So if 0.2 moles of nitrogen have reacted, they will have created double that amount of ammonia. So two times 0.2 is, that's gonna be up 0.4. So 1 plus 0.4 is 1.4. So what are we looking at then? So the hydrogen will be in 0.4, so it could be that one or that one. And then the ammonia being 1.4 be that one. Notice that one, that would have been if you'd, if you'd missed the fact that there was one mole of ammonia at the start and you just put a zero, that's how you would have then gone for that one. So you've got to re carefully read the question, make sure you get all the information because it's unusual where they've actually got some product in there as well already at the start. So we want B. What describes HPO4 2 minus? Uh, well, it's amphiprotic because, of course, if you've got HPO4 2 minus, well, that could lose another proton and become the phosphate ion. So it can act as an acid. Alternatively, it could pick a proton up and then it could uh, become H2PO4 with a uh, 1 minus charge if it picked up a proton. So that'd be adding a H plus, that'd be losing a H plus. So it kind of went on that way. So it's amphiprotic. So it's amphiprotic because it can act as a bonded Lowry acid or base. It can accept or donate a proton. Amphoteric just basically means it can act as an acid or a base. It's much less specific. So if it's amphiprotic, it's amphoteric as well. Okay, so uh, it can act as an acid or a base and it can act as a bonded Lowry acid or base by accepting a proton or uh, donating a proton. Twenty-five. What is the pH of a solution in which the hydroxide ion concentration is one times ten to the minus eleven? And there's the ionic product of water, Kw. So of course, Kw is the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus. So if we want to find H plus, that's Kw divided by OH minus. So that's one times ten to the minus fourteen divided by one times ten to the minus eleven. Now, I'm not the best on my mental mass, but I know that when you do one uh, standard form divided by another, 
basically it's almost like a subtraction of the indices. So the difference between minus 14 and minus uh, 11 would be uh, a difference of minus 3. So that's 1 times minus 3. Okay. And then that kind of makes sense as well that that's going to be a very low concentration. So that must be a relatively high concentration in comparison. And of course, basically, the way you easily convert that is that's basically 1 times 10 to the minus pH is what the uh, H plus ion concentration is. So that value there is actually the pH value. And of course, a minus pH, that makes it positive. So we're looking at A would be 3. Okay, and that makes sense because that's a very low concentration of hydroxide and that's because the concentration of hydrogen ions is relatively high and therefore it's acidic. 7, they'd both be 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Which statements are correct? Lewis bases can act as nucleophiles. Well, yes, they've got lone pairs of electrons, so they can act as nucleophiles. Electrophiles are Lewis acids. Uh, well, yeah, they're both looking for pairs of electrons. They're looking to accept a pair of electrons, so that's correct. Uh, Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors. That's true. Lewis bases are electron pair donors. And Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors. So that's true as well. So it's one, two, and three. Which combination of acid and base is most likely to have a pH of 8.5 with the equivalence point of titration? So it ends up that once you've undergone neutralization, it's still slightly alkaline. Well, these guys here would give you sodium chloride and water. So at this one, you'd have a pH about 7 at the equivalence point. So your pH would be 7 at the equivalence point. Hydrochloric acid and ammonia, well, that would give you ammonium chloride plus water. And of course, ammonium is still a weak acid. So this would actually give you a pH a little less than 7 at the equivalence point. It would still be uh, slightly acidic uh, at the neutralization point, the equivalence point, because we'd have ammonium ions present, NH4+, plus, which would be a weak acid. Similarly here, this would also give you ammonium ions, NH4+, plus, albeit there's uh, the nitrate ions swimming around, plus H2O. So again, this would give you a pH you'd expect a little below 7 because you'd have acidic ammonium ions, which is a uh, say conjugate acid. Uh, methanoic acid and sodium hydroxide, well, that would at the end would give you HCOO- minus, and then Na+. Plus. So we'd have a weak conjugate base in there at the end of the reaction. So we'd have a weak conjugate base in there, and that's why the solution would then still have a slightly alkaline pH. So it would be above 8.5, because now we've got a significant amount of this conjugate base uh, present. So we're going to go with D. Again, the pH would be uh, greater than 7 at the equivalence point. 28. Which equation shows oxygen undergoing reduction? Well, here fluorine is zero, the oxygen is zero. Uh, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, so this is the unusual circumstance where the fluorine is minus one and the oxygen must be plus two. So that's an increase in oxidation number, so that is an uh, oxidation, not a reduction. So it can't be that one because the oxygen has increased in oxidation number, that's an oxidation. What about this one here? Well, the oxygen is minus two there, it's minus two there, it's still minus two here, so that's not even a redox process because your sodium is plus one, your hydrogen is plus one, and still, so there's no change in oxidation state there, so it's not even a redox. Here we've got hydrogen peroxide, the hydrogen's a plus one, the oxygen's are actually minus one, so again, this is one of the funny ones to watch out for. It's neutral overall, if the hydrogen's a plus one, and there's two of them, then each of the oxygens must be minus one, then they cancel out. Uh, the hydrogen's plus one, the hydrogen's minus one, hydrogen is still plus one, but now the oxygen is minus two. So your oxygen has decreased in oxidation number, so that is a reduction. It's gone from minus 1 down to minus 2, so that's a reduction. That's the one we're looking for. And of course, the iodine has been oxidized from minus 1 up to 0. And then this one here, uh, so your oxygen is minus 2 there. It's still minus 2 here. Um, the chromium, that's 4 times minus 2 is 8 minus. Bring it back 2 minus, that would have to be plus 6. And it's still plus 6 in this one here as well. 2 times 17 is 40 minus. To bring it back to 2 minus, you'd need 12 plus. 12 plus divided by 2 would be plus 6. Plus 1, plus 1, minus 2. So again, this isn't actually a redox process. So we want C. Twenty-nine. What are the products of electrolysis when concentrated calcium bromide solution is electrolyzed using graphite electrodes? Okay, so what ions have we got? We've got calcium two plus and H plus, and we've got Br minus and OH minus. So opposites attract. So the positive ions will be attracted to the negative electrode. 
Now, when it's a solution chemistry, of course, we've got the competition between the calcium ions and the hydrogen ions from the water, because water can split apart into H plus and OH minus. And we get whatever is lowest in the reactivity series, because basically the lower in the reactivity series it is, the less happy it is being an ion and wants to be discharged to lose its charge. So we're going to get hydrogen, because hydrogen is less reactive than calcium, so it's going to be that one or that one. If we wanted calcium, we'd have to use the molten salt. And then, okay, we've got hydroxide. Technically, hydroxide beats everything. But we normally accept halide beats hydroxide, hydroxide beats anything else. And that's why they put this caveat in here of that unless it's an extremely dilute solution, we always get the halide salt. And by halide salt, I mean anything from group 7. So bromine is in group 7. So we're going to get bromine discharged in preference to hydroxide. So bromine, bromine. So this one here would be A. Oxygen would come if the hydroxide which is, was discharged, but then we'd need a dilute solution. Very dilute. And then number 30, which combination would electroplate an object with copper? Well, remember what we need is the copper ions to attach to the object we want to plate. So the object we want to plate has to be the negative electrode because that's going to be given electrons to the copper ions to turn them into copper atoms. So why is our negative electrode? So that's going to have to be the object that we want to plate. And then what's going on at this one will be the copper uh, will be losing electrons to form copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons and then they'll be discharging going across onto here so our electron flow is this way and so on so uh, yeah we want the negative one just remember we need the negative one to be the uh, the object because that's then going to provide the electrons to give the copper ions their uh, turn them back into copper atoms and then uh, I want a solution of copper sulfate I would say yeah I'm gonna go with that one and that one so it looks like B to me yeah so that would be copper that will get smaller and smaller as it becomes copper ions the object will then pick up the, um, the copper ions and as they turn into copper atoms and then you'll have copper sulfate to um, give you uh, plenty of uh, copper ions uh, swimming around so I'm gonna go with B